All right, well, we're picking up where we left off in Ephesians chapter number 5, and we're in verse number 18 now. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 18, Paul writes, uh, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So, as, as he had mentioned in the previous verse, don't be foolish, know what the, what the will of the Lord is, understand what it is, right? He had mentioned about walking, don't, don't, don't be unwise, be wise, don't be foolish. Well, the thought continues, do not get drunk with wine. So don't become foolish, don't become foolish by something, uh, by being inebriated with alcohol. Uh, if a believer becomes drunk with wine, as he says here, the result is going to be that you're not in control. You're not in control of one's faculties. And I'm sure <laughs> all of us have come into contact with somebody who was inebriated, and you look at the situation and you think, wow, what a foolish individual. <laughs> or even sometimes... Uh, some of us in a previous life, if I may use that kind of term, uh, went down that path and looked back and go, wow, I did some foolish things. So Proverbs 20, verse 1, the writer says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler, and whoever is intoxicated by it is not wise. And so Paul is picking up on that thing. I mean, if you're going to become intoxicated and inebriated with wine, then you're not a very wise person. Actually, you're a fool. Now, wine, as it is really even in today's culture, but certainly in Paul's culture, that ancient Near East, uh, it was a staple. It was a staple in banquets. It was a staple in drinking parties. Uh, the Greco-Roman culture, are you kidding? Uh, to get inebriated, if I may just use the term drunk, that was the norm. And so for believers coming out of that world, and now you're a believer, no, no, you're not, you're not going down that old path, the, same, the path you used to walk. Now he's not... Obviously, he's not prohibiting the use of alcoholic beverages. He's pro prohibiting the abuse of alcoholic beverages. There's a, there's a big difference between drinking wine and getting drunk, just the same as there's a big difference between eating food and committing gluttony. You, you can use speech. You can use speech to glorify God. You can use speech to destroy somebody. It's all about control. Control the tongue, control the mouth, control the drinking, control. It's about control. Uh, the word is wine. Drunk with wine. And the Greek word there is oinos. Oinos is not grape juice. For those of us that had been uh, discipled in the fundamental Baptist church, and I'm thankful that I was, uh, the teaching is that in the scriptures, uh, uh, one is not to drink at all. And I'm not going to get into that, but the Greek word here is oinos. Oinos is not grape juice. Oinos is wine. Okay. Uh, in the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, called the Septuagint, we have the story, of course, very well known, Genesis chapter 9, post-flood, Noah plants a vineyard, Noah drinks from the vi vineyard, Noah gets drunk. The Greek word there, oinos. He got drunk off of oinos. Here in Paul's letter, do not be drunk with oinos. Now there's another famous story in John chapter 3. Allow me to read it to you. Yeshua said to them, Fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. When the head waiter tasted the water, which had become oinos, wine, 
and did not know where it came from. But the servants who had drawn the water knew. The head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first. And when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine, oinos, until now. Same word. Same exact word. So you can't differentiate and say, okay, well, what Jesus made here in John chapter 3 and what Noah drank back in Genesis chapter 9 are two different things. That's not what the scriptures say at all. It's all about control. Having control. Control over drinking. Control over eating. Control over your speech. Control over your actions. Control. So he says, do not get drunk with wine. Have control, for that is dissipation. Uh, the Greek word there is uh, osatia. It describes loose living, or to squander away, dissipation. So a believer not ought not to abuse alcohol, which leads to reckless behavior and speech. So don't do that. In a Greco-Roman culture, <laughs> what's wrong with that? He says, no, don't do that. Be in control at all times. At all times. So don't drink, for that would be reckless reckless kind of behavior. Don't get drunk, but be filled with the Spirit. When you are filled with the Spirit, you will be controlled by the Spirit. <laughs> okay? Less Spirit, or I should say more Spirit, less of me. That's a good thing. More Spirit, less of me. Be, fi be filled with the Spirit. When, the, when you're filled with the Spirit, the Spirit's in control. Now, this is a, 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 a passage and a phrase I'm going to have to take a little, more, a little extra time on. Be filled with the Spirit. So let's understand exactly what Paul is talking about. What does he mean to be filled with the Spirit? Our brothers and sisters in the charismatic movement, have taken this passage, this phrase right here, okay, and I'm talking the, not the extremists, but there, there is a faction that would say, okay, when you get saved, you have the Holy Ghost. But then there is a filling of the Holy Ghost. So you can be saved, have the Holy Ghost, but then there's a filling of the Holy Ghost, and when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, then you speak in tongues. That's not what he's saying. To be filled with the Spirit is not some kind of New Testament phenomena which came about and was birthed at Pentecost. Because if that was the case, and our charismatic brothers and sisters are right, then what they're saying is that filling of the Spirit happened in Acts chapter 2. If that's, if that's the basis of your filling with the Spirit then you've got major problems with your hermeneutics. Why do I mean that? Why do I say that? Because Exodus 31, beginning in verse 2, says, See, I have called my, by name, God speaking, Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Ur, Hor, of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all kinds of craftsmanship. That was back in Exodus. So to be filled with the Spirit is not some kind of Acts chapter 2 New Testament phenomenon. This goes back to all believers. All believers have had the Holy Spirit. Micah chapter 3 verse 8. On the other hand, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and courage to make known to Jacob his rebellious act, even to Israel his sin. That's back in Micah. We're talking about being filled with the Spirit. How about Luke chapter 1, verse 41? When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke 1, verse 67, and his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit. So the, being filled with the Holy Spirit is not some kind of phenomena that happened after Pentecost. All believers from the beginning have had the Holy Spirit. You cannot know God, you cannot understand God, you cannot pray to God, you cannot even uh, please God unless that life exists in you. That spirit is there. 
Luke chapter 4 and verse 1. Yeshua, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. Okay, so let's look at this filling. Okay, notice the Greek does not say to be filled of the Spirit. It says, in the Spirit. In the Spirit. So when that word is found, so when that word is found in such a prepositional phrase, when you see that phrase, to be filled, now in our passage it says to be filled with the Spirit. But in other passages it says to be filled in the Spirit. To be filled in the Spirit is a prepositional phrase, and it means a location. So Tim Haig writes, and he kind of, uh, in his commentary, explains this for us. Thus, when the Scriptures command the believer to be filled in the Spirit, the meaning is that we, who confess Yeshua to be our Messiah and Savior, are to continually fill up our lives in the realm of the Spirit. That is, in those things of life which please the Spirit, who dwells within us, and not to participate in those things that grieve the Spirit of God, by whom we were sealed for the day of redemption, Ephesians 4.30. So, if you have the Spirit, don't, you're not, you don't want to grieve the Spirit, walk in it, be filled in with the Spirit, and in the Spirit. If you, if you turn yourselves over to alcohol and you don't control it and you become drunk, there's no control. The spirit is not in control, the alcohol is in control, and you're going to grieve the spirit. So there's a control there. So we're continuing. Now this thought of, okay, you don't want to, you don't want to be like the pagans, you don't want to act like the heathens, you maybe that's what you used to do. You're a believer now, okay? Walk, walk with the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit. Continuing, verse 19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. So when you fill up your lives in the realm of the Spirit, as Tim Hag had written, you will mature in your faith. You will mature in your faith and you will grow in your ability to minister and please one another edification, edifying the body, helping others grow. As I've said before, you know you're maturing in your faith when you're helping others mature in their faith. So, how many of us, including myself, how many of us contemplate that when we speak to one another, we speak through, we speak through the words we sing. We speak to one another in the words that we sing. So, if we're filled with the Spirit, continuing this theme, and let's, let's go back, because again, let, let's be very clear about what that term means, to be filled with the Spirit, as we move on into this 19th verse. We're speaking to one another with our, with our songs, with our, with our singing, as you'll see here. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So if I'm filled with the Spirit, which would lead to some unknown language, some kind of ec ecstatic, uh, ec uh, ecstatic speech, some kind of utterances, some kind of gibberish, how would we be able to speak to one another and be filled with the Spirit? Because he says right here, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. How would we be able to even understand one another and be edified? He uses the term psalms, psalmas, which are you, those kind of psalms are usually accompanied with stringed instruments. And you see those especially, of course, in the book of Psalms. So those are psalms that usually are accompanied with some kind of stringed instrument. So he uses that, psalms and hymns, humnas. It's a song of praise to God. And that 
particular word is only used twice in the Apostolic Scriptures. And it's both times it's used by Paul. Here in our, our passage in Ephesians 5 as well as Colossians 3.16. Colossians 3.16, Paul says, Let the word of Messiah richly dwell within you, with all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Same thought, same thought process. So we got psalms, we got hymns, spiritual songs. Uh, pneumatikas, pneuma, uh, pneum, uh, not a, uh, what, easy. And the word is hode, hode. So these are songs that are aligned with the Spirit of God. So we've got song psalms that are accompanied with string instruments. We've got spiritual songs, as you see here, aligned with the Spirit of God. We've got songs of praise to God. And all of these are accomplished when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit. Um, as I look back, as I was going through this passage and putting down my notes, music has, and or I should say, can take an effect on people. I think we're we're all in agreement on that. I remember back being saved and having that spirit, but not being filled with the spirit. And I was immature. I wasn't hanging around with the, the right crowd at the time. And I got involved with a kind and a style of music that certainly wasn't pleasing to God. In fact, it was a worldly music. It was loud. It was fast. And it was angry. And it, it could be angry. It could be depressing. It could be... A, I, either of those things. Um, very sensual, very sexual. Uh, and that's the, that's the kind of music I, would, I, was, I used to listen to. And I could remember as I listened to those, to those lyrics, even though the sound, I enjoyed the sound, the, the lyrics bothered me. The lyrics bothered me. And if... if if I pushed the, the, the Spirit's conviction aside, and I would push it aside, the lyrics from the music would make me angry, or depressed, or any of those things. When I just, and, and I know, I grieved His Spirit, because I just pushed it aside, because I was going to do what I wanted to do. The music I listen to is so much different now. I don't listen to that kind of worldly music anymore. And now the music that I listen to, it's, a, it's an entirely different feeling. It's a, it's a feeling of praise. It's a feeling of glory. It's a, a, it's a humbleness. It's a thankfulness. That's not the kind of feelings I had before when I was listening to the world's music. So when you're filled with the Spirit, you're going to be praising God. You're going to be singing to God. Maybe instruments are going to be involved in this. But... It's going to be a worshipful experience, and there's, it's a peaceful experience. He says, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, when you're filled with the Spirit. When you're filled with the Spirit, not only will your actions show praise, but the songs will come from a heart of gratitude. Singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Verses 20 and 21. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Messiah. Always giving thanks. The thought continues with a heart of gratitude and praise when you're filled with the Spirit. When you're filled with the Spirit, your entire day, you're thinking about God and you're talking with God and you're allowing God to have control in your decision making. Again, if you're drunk with wine, the flesh takes over. So always giving thanks for all things. For all things. <laughs> Those are the things. If we're giving thanks for all things, 
then that would include some of those things that it appears are working against us. I think we can all remember there are events in our, in, our, in our lives where you go, man, God, why are you working against me? And that's not the case at all. And Paul is saying when you're filled with the Spirit, you're giving thanks for all things. Romans 8.28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good. To those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Even the things we may not like. Maybe the things that we don't understand. The things that we fret about and we get aggravated about. And you have to take a step back and you take a breath and you sit down and you go, wait a minute. Instead of complaining, I really should be giving thanks. I may not understand why this is happening. I might not even like it. But I should be giving thanks. And if you're not giving thanks, and if I'm not giving thanks, then I'm obviously not filled with the Spirit. There are times and there are circumstances which are beyond our control. Give thanks. There are times and circumstances due to our own poor decision making. Give thanks. Because really, at the end of the day, even when we make the bad decisions, we don't consult him, we don't pray, we don't, don't go to the scriptures, we don't meditate on it, and we make a decision based on the flesh. Guess what? God allows you to do it, more often than not. There are some times he will interview, intervene and he stops it, dead its tracks. More often than not, he will allow you and me to make those bad decisions. Yet he's in control. And those are, we can classify that under that banner of all things. <laughs> all things. Give thanks. Always giving thanks for all things. In the name of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. It's his name. It's his position. He is our high priest. In the name of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. To God, even the Father. So praise be to Yeshua for his finished and accomplished work, which allows us access to God, who is our Father. Colossians 1.17 Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Yeshua, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So we're giving thanks, we're filled with the Spirit, we're singing melodies, we're edifying one another, we're giving thanks, even when we don't understand it, and then he throws this one at you. And be subject to one another. And be subject to one another. So while praising him, and I'm glorifying him, and I'm lifting up his name, I'm, we're actually to be submitting to one another as well in the process. While praising him, we submit to one another. Should be a mutual submission while worshiping, as well as singing in the community. Philippians chapter 2, beginning of verse 3. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Messiah Yeshua, who... Although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by being, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Be subject to one another. Yeshua laid down the regalness of heaven itself and took on the form of a servant. The, the ultimate example of servitude. And now he says, be subject to one another. And if we're filled with the Spirit, we will be. Because if we're filled with the Spirit, it's Yeshua's Spirit. And Yeshua was a servant. And so that Spirit is going to call upon us to be that servant to one another. 
Tim Higgs says, this call to mutual submission in the sense of looking out for the good of others, helping one another and not being self-assertive, nor each one insisting that they get their own way, is an essential and needed element if a local assembly is to succeed in giving forth a true witness of Messiah. In the local assembly, be filled with the Spirit, we're lifting up songs, sometimes they are accompanied with instruments, we're giving thanks all the time, we're giving thanks for all things, in the name of our Lord, to, uh, through, the, through the work, the finished work of Yeshua, who is our High Priest, to God who is our Father, and we're submitting to one another. Your needs are more important than my needs. And all of this is to be done, final words in that verse, in the fear of Messiah. In the fear of Messiah. So there's a humble respect. There's a humble respect for Yeshua's position before the Father. In the fear of Messiah. So Yeshua came. He did the work that he was supposed to do. He accomplished it. He accomplished it perfectly. He's the telos. He's the goal. Everything that you have given me to do, Father, I've done it. And he always, he always, he always submitted to the Father. Your will, not mine, not mine, but your will be done. He submitted to the Father in all things. Likewise, if we're filled with His Spirit, we'll be singing melodies, we'll be rejoicing, we'll be in control, we'll allow His Spirit to be in control of all things, our mouth, our eating, our drinking, our walking, everything. We're going to give thanks, and we're going to submit to one another and, and be subject to one another and lifting up one another and helping to mature one another and help e each other to grow. Why? Because we fear his, or we re it's a healthy respect of his position. He is the head. We're the body. So we're going to stop right there. We're going to hit pause, and then next time we're going to pick it up uh, with verse number 22.